In spite of the secrecy, some prisoners early on escaped from Auschwitz and they talked about what was happening there. Now, uh, during the First World War, they weren't believed, basically, for two reasons. During the First World War, there had been both sides that engaged in propaganda, a propaganda war telling complete total lies about the other side. And so they were exaggerating the, what, what each side was doing. And it turned out after the war, this came to light, that both sides had used propaganda machines to invent stories about the other side. So when these people escaped from Auschwitz, people said again, yeah, right, you know, this is, uh, this is too horrible, nobody could be doing this. So in general, they weren't believed. And so there was a few people who escaped, but it was, there was never during the war a general uh, belief in Europe that the Jews were being systematically killed. Now, and the documentation shows that the exact fate of the deported Jews was not explicitly known. There were fears were expressed. I mean, St. Pius, uh, Pius XII, what he does say in one of his documents near the very end of the war, that he fears for the fate of those Jews because they're being, they're being um, transported, and I fear that they're being worked to death. You know, so he, feel, he fears that he, he fears for them, he fears for their fate, but he does not know about the gas chambers. Because he, it's a very late document, I think it's 19, uh, late 1944, and he's still, 1944, and he still doesn't know in that uh, document that the Jews are being gassed to death. So it's very secret. Mm -hmm. the, the Vatican documents show that Pius XII was still in the dark on the exact fate of the Jews right up to the end of the war, even though it was clear that those deportations meant death for, for many of them. So faced with this, Pius had two choices. He could make a public denunciation, excommunicate Hitler, who was actually a baptized Catholic, or he could do specific, he could encourage the local hierarchy to undertake um, actions to try and help the Jews. And he did a little bit of both. Um, he used, uh, in his Christmas message of 1942, he said the following. He said, the hun he talked about the hundreds of thousands who through no fault of their own and solely because of their, na their, their nation or their race have been condemned to death or progressive extinction. And so that's a direct re refer referral reference to the, to the Nazis. And they understood that. And it's, a, it's a kind of diplomatic language that the Pope's wartime messages were couched in, but, um, but uh, that, is, uh, that was understood by everyone at the time to, to refer to the Nazis. They reacted very violently to this. When, they, when, when it came out, and they tried to block that from being circulated in Germany. Well, why didn't he issue that condemnation before? Because the final solution only began in 1942, which was the year of his um, message, and because he was trying to find a way to make peace and to salvage something out of the war. And as I say, the Allies wanted him to condemn Germany by name, but this he wouldn't do because he said he would also have to condemn their own actions during the war. And the Germans reacted with rage to that broadcast, they knew they were being targeted, and the German ambassador to the Holy See was told to threaten the Pope and the Church. And in his report back, we have that document, it says the Pope is not the, the slightest bit afraid of any threats, and he threatened back that if it came to war between Germany and the Church, the result would be a Church victory, as history has always shown. So the Nazis admired his courage, and the Vatican had that <coughs> the mercy of the Germans. They could have walked into the Vatican and taken the Pope prisoner if they wanted to. Now, there were some messages like that throughout the war. Uh, the Observatory Romano, uh, the newspaper of the, of the Vatican and the Radio Vatican, were, were saying things like this. But the effect of each one of these was invariably to engender reprisals and more persecution. So whenever there was an outright denunciation of what the Germans were doing, then they would come back with a, a reprisal. They would persecute more Jews. The most famous example of that is in 1942 in Holland. Up until that time, the Dutch Jews, who had converted to Catholicism, had been spared. And so there were a lot of Jews who had converted to Catholicism who were in, in, uh, in Holland, and they had not been arrested with the other Jews. On July the 26th, 1942, a protest against the deportation of the Jews was read in all the Catholic parishes. And they had been warned by the Nazis. The Protestant churches had had the same message, and they had also been warned by the Nazis, and the Protestant churches backed down. They didn't read that denunciation, but the Catholic churches did. So a week later, on August the 2nd, 1942, all the Catholic Jews were rounded up and deported, including Edith Stein, and St. Edith Stein. So um, she, she basically was killed because of that, because of that action of the priests 
who denounced the Nazi regime in public from the, um, from the pulpit. In Holland, 78% of all the Jews were killed. It was the highest percentage of any country in Europe. So as a result of that and other events like it, Pius XII decided to leave it up to the local bishops to decide what to do in each case to avoid as much as possible the suffering and death of the Jews. He pointed out that each word had to be weighed carefully in order to avoid doing more harm than good. Now he wasn't afraid for himself, and nothing would have been easier than for him to make a grandiose public statement of denunciation, excommunication of the Nazis who were Catholics. That would have led to his own martyrdom, and it would have ended up, of course, with a much greater persecution of the Jews. So today, instead of debating the silence of Pius XII, we would be debating the imprudence of Pius XII. You can't, you can't really win in these, uh, in these cases. <clears throat> so the Nazis did not want a public denunciation, but they, because they feared that that would cause doubts among their own Catholic soldiers. Let's say 35% or 33% of Germany was Catholic. And most of those soldiers didn't know about the final solution, of course. And most of them felt that they were fighting a just war against their nation's enemies. So the Nazis feared that. But if a public denunciation had been made, they would have retaliated brutally. That, we have that from the Nuremberg trials. All the leaders of the Nazis said that, and if the Catholic Church had dared to go further, then uh, they would have reacted uh, brutally. They would not have caved in at all. So even though the, denun the denunciation would not have helped, the threat of denunciation saved many thousands of lives. So again and again, protests by the Vatican against the, um, the, the treatment of the Jews led to some Jews being released, led to a slowing down in the persecution. So the threats did have a, an effect. And so that's what they used, basically. So Vatican Radio and Observatory Romano were more specific in their denunciations, but the bishops were wrote to the Pope and they asked the Pope to tone them down. Because of course, when uh, the Catholic Church would come out against the, the, the Nazis, then it was Catholics who were suffering, and not just the Jews. And so there were uh, letters written to Pius XII asking him to cool it. You know, we don't want denunciations of the Nazis. They always end up causing us more trouble than, than, than help. So doing so would have been counterproductive. So, they, um, they, so what, the, what Pius XII did then was to start a large-scale underground movement instructing all the hierarchy throughout Europe to try to save the Jews. Between 1964 and 1981, all the documentation of the Holy See having to do with World War II was edited and published by the Vatican in 11 thick volumes, usually about 1,500 pages each. And uh, there's a nice resume in one volume in English by a, a French priest who was one of the editors of that. Both of so, um, and it shows the, there's an evidence there of the enormous efforts the Vatican made to save Jewish lives and the lives of prisoners of wars. When bishops and nuncios were thanked at the end of the war, they all said that all they were doing was obeying the instructions of the Pope. They were verbal instructions, of course, you know, in, that, in that case. So during a period where the Jewish immigration was permitted, no one wanted to take them. But working through the nuncios of different countries, Pius XII was able to obtain thousands of visas for Jews to travel to South America, and he put pressure on the governments of South America to accept them. He got the government of Spain to accept any Jew who would show Spanish ancestry. Spain was neutral in the war, it didn't, it didn't take part. So many Jews were descendants of those who had been expelled from Spain in the 15th century. <coughs> to prove that, then they could get into uh, Spain. The Vatican spent huge sums of money paying for all this, and paying for transport. The Pope issued, well, he had issued uh, fake Vatican passports. He gave, he gave teaching positions to in particular universities to Hebrew scholars, so they would be safe in the, um, in the, in the Vatican. Uh, he, there were efforts of bishops and nuncios in Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Croatia, through protests, false Vatican passports, false baptismal certificates, hiding them in monasteries and churches and Catholic homes, and giving them sanctuary wherever they could. 